I want to welcome you and all of those uh, who are joining us um, to the virtual campus of Pentecostal Theological Seminary. Um, we're going to be doing several of these uh, webinars over the next um, uh, uh, over the next 12 months. I had originally planned to do uh, one a month, but we have so many things that we would like to cover and so many uh, uh, topics that we can that we can talk about that uh, I'm just going I'm going to do my best to try to do these as often as we can. Um, today we're going to be talking about the challenges of early career pastors. And as we talk about these challenges, um, uh, I'm having trouble here with my windows. If you're wondering what's going on here, here we go. Okay, one of the th one of the things we're going to do today is talk about challenges of early, early career pastors. And I I've often thought about uh, ministry uh, like battle and ministerial preparation like uh, boot camp. And the difference is boot camp can teach you how to use a weapon. Boot camp can train you, get you physically ready to go. But nothing prepares you for war except war. And, and pastoring is the same way. You know, regardless of how we prepare ourselves for pastoring, we can learn how to read scripture. We can learn hermeneutics. We can learn things about administration. There are a lot of things we can learn, whether we get it in, in ministerial internship programs or graduate studies. But the fact is that nothing prepares you for pastoring but pastoring. Um, you know, there is something about that experience of pastoring. And there are many challenges when we're talking about early career pastors. There are many challenges that uh, people just are unprepared for. Um, I know I was unprepared for it. And I have to tell you that after 38 years of pastoring, I don't know that I ever got really prepared for it. It was always changing. It's always changing. It's always learning something new. Um, but, you know, uh, things like uh, congregational conflict, things like administration, um, you know, in the last uh, two or three years, we've been having to deal with this pandemic. We've had to think on our feet. We've had to move. I mean, really, we go from week to week. Um, Roger, you just posted today that you're not having services this weekend because of so many conflicts at, at, at Glenville because of the pandemic. Uh, not only do we have pandemic issues, we have profound cultural issues with uh, culture redefining human sexuality. We have profound uh, political issues that seems to be fracturing the nation. And pastors cannot avoid these things. And so what we want to do specifically when we're talking about early career pastors, we're talking about pastors who are, you know, roughly five years or less uh, in the ministry even though you may have a background that goes uh, beyond that. But what I wanted to do, uh, gentlemen, get you three guys together, and let's just talk about our experiences, talk about some of the challenges and how we have um, resolved some of those challenges. So first, before we go any further, I'd like for you guys to introduce yourselves, take about two minutes each. Um, we'll do this alphabetically. That means Drew Eastes goes first. So Drew, tell us uh, what you think we, ought to, we need to know about yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Drew Eastus, as you said. Uh, I spent 14 years as a full-time evangelist, and then the Sunday before the pandemic started, I went into pastoral ministry. Uh, my evangelist friends thought I was a genius because I got out of evangelism the Sunday before it all shut down, and my pastor friends thought I was an idiot because I got into pastoring right when it all fell apart for them, too. So, uh, yeah, unique situation. But I went on as an executive pastor at North Sparta, and Steve Gearhart is, is there, and, and he and I share a vision for intergenerational ministry. So it's a really unique situation uh, that we kind of lead the church shoulder to shoulder, and I handle administration and finances and the staff, and then he does the counseling and the pastoral care and that sort of aspect, and then we split up the preaching responsibilities. And uh, it's been a beautiful experience despite the, the difficulties. And, and two, our context here is unique because we had started the revitalization program here in Tennessee uh, right before the pandemic hit. And so we were going through revitalization in the midst of a pandemic. The church had been declining marginally for about five years. And of course, the first Sunday of the pandemic, like everybody, about a fourth of our people disappeared and never returned, right? So, so we're dealing with that. Um, thankfully, we went through that process the last couple of years, and, and now we're running about 80 people above what we were 
before the pandemic started and, and thank God. But, but with all that came changes and challenges and all the things we got to talk about today. So, but that's, that's me. And that's kind of the context of where I'm at. Uh, take just a moment, Drew. I want them to know you're uh, a THD candidate at Drew. Uh, you've done the graduate degree. His uh, thesis was on the preaching of Ray Hughes. Uh, right. I just wanted to acknowledge that. That's how I got to know Drew. And uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate his contribution. And Drew, I appreciate you being here with us today. All right, Thank Michael, uh, I want to let everybody know that you and I have a history together. Uh, Michael is a graduate of Pentecostal Theological Seminary, and we met, I think the first time is when you were taking our pastoral ministries class. And, uh, and he's also gone through some uh, coaching with us. And so uh, uh, it's a joy to have Michael with us. Michael, introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, uh, it's never, um, it never dawns on me. I think about you often, uh, Dr. Tomberlin. Um, as he said, my name is Michael Mack. Um, I pastor a small little church in Oakwood, uh, Georgia, and um, for, I spent about 10 years in the military prior to uh, getting on the, uh, the path to real war. Um, I deployed... <laughs> I deployed seven times in five years with, with my unit. Um, and I came out of that. It was, it was pretty strategic, um, moment in my life. I, I had really broken down and given my heart to God. Um, I was not very saved, um, uh, prior to getting out of the military, but I had a, a, a unique encounter with God, uh, which led me to this point in my life. Um, greatest decision I ever made. And uh, I, I don't really look back. I'm always looking forward, um, trying to figure out how to study, how to better myself. Uh, more importantly, I, I married um, a great woman. Her name is Jennifer. We have two kids um, and I have a total of five kids. Uh, went through some rough times in my life, but um, at, at the end of the day, God's been right there with me. And uh, I'm really just looking forward to having this conversation to see where it takes us and learning from all of you. Thank you, Michael, for taking the time to join us. Roger Nelson, again, I need to let everybody know Roger and I have history together. We served together at uh, Vidalia, Georgia. He was our student pastor. So for better or for worse, he probably knows me better than anybody else on, uh, here as a panelist. So Roger, introduce yourself. Well, as Dan said, my name is Roger Nelson. Uh, I pastor Restoration Point Church of God in Glenville, Georgia. Uh, actually from Glenville, I'm privileged right now to be able to pastor the church that I was raised up in. Uh, and I'm almost too old for this, according to what Dan said at the beginning, because uh, I'll be pastoring six years in August here uh, where we're at. So I'm out of the new pastor window almost. I've been called to preach. I knew when I was 16 and ran from it, did everything that I could but try and preach or pastor uh, until 2003. Uh, when I started back in the credentialing process with the Church of God, I got my credentials in June of 2003 and been with the Church of God as a youth pastor, a children's pastor, and associate pastor since then, but uh, enjoying learning and growing as a pastor and uh, enjoy this opportunity to be on the panel today to talk and learn and grow some more uh, as we communicate together about all of our challenges as pastors. I want to make a couple of points here, and I, I just want to kind of lift up where we are. And I think that is um, important for this conversation. Uh, first of all, none of us here are mega church pastors. Um, and I think that's important because, you know, everybody has this aspiration. We all wanted our church to grow. We, we, that's what we're working for. We're doing evangelization. But we all know that the majority of pastors, all of the studies across, across all denominational traditions, uh, most pastors will spend their entire careers and never pastor a church of more than 100 people. That's just the bottom line. Those of us who grow churches larger than that are in the minority. Uh, so I deliberately chose this group of people for that reason, because you, will re you represent most first-time and novice early career pastors are not pastoring a church of three or 400. They're pastoring churches of 30, 40, 50. If they've got 100 people, that's, that's unusual. So we're talking from our encounter and our experience as early career pastors, as pastors who uh, have this call of God, recognizing where our experience is. The second thing is, 
Uh, Drew has a graduate degree. Michael has a graduate degree. Roger does not. But now I do want to say this. Roger is one of the smartest, well-read pastors that I've ever known. And I'm always after him to come to PTS. He needs that graduate degree. So I'm going to publicly shame him just a little bit. Roger, it's time to register. But now with all sincerity, I do want to say this because, you know, people are asking me all, all the time about their educational level. And what I've always said is we need an educational level based on where we envision ourselves. Everybody does not need a graduate degree. And everybody does not need a doctoral degree, um, but it does depend upon where we are. And even those of us who don't have formal education um, need to learn to read. We need to learn to read. We need to learn to continue to enlighten ourselves, to, to become aware of what's going on around us. And so, and I mean this with all my heart, I, I've, I've had good conversations with Drew. I know of his um his academic abilities. Michael was a student. I'm aware of his academic abilities. I've worked with Roger. Roger is one of the smartest guys I know. He's one of the most sincere uh, pastors I know. Uh, Roger could be my pastor. That's how much confidence I have in him. So uh, I, we represent what Church of God and what Pentecostal ministry looks like. Some of us have graduate degrees. Most of us don't. So, you know, that's, that's I want us to acknowledge that uh, but you know, as the good, as the good assist, assistant professor would be, uh, let's, let's bone up, let, let's do our job. So I want to start the conversation here just by, and I'm going to do this in the same order we, um, uh, introduced ourselves. So we'll start with, uh, Pastor Eastes, um, talking about, um, what surprised you. I know that you'd been an evangelist. I know that you had, uh, been involved in ministry. It's the church world. The church culture is no, you're no stranger to it, but there is a difference when you're doing, when you're doing leadership in a local church. What surprised you about pastoring? People were far more divided than I expected, which may just be a pandemic issue that has made that kind of rise to the forefront. Let I don't know. I have, me, I have no previous me, experience to know. Let me stop you a moment. That happened before the pandemic. Now go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, you know, exacerbated it, uh, make it worse. I mean, I, I remember uh, the Sunday after we came back into our building, I was sitting in my office and a person come in my office and said, uh, you know, pastor, I can't believe you got all these protocols in place. You're taking our freedom and you're trying to stomp on our liberties and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I tried to talk them down on it. About five minutes later, someone come in the office they said, you aren't following any of the rules. You're going to get everyone here killed. Don't you, do you hate us? What's wrong with you? And I thought, now, listen, one of the two of you have to be wrong. You know, I either got to do all of them or none of them. It can't be both. But, um, you know, I say that and overall air people were just, just wonderful. They really were, you know, 95% of them were just tremendous. Uh, but you had the 5% of, of, of people who were really vocal about the division. And it just let me know what everyone else was kind of thinking, even though they didn't speak it necessarily. Um, but yeah, the, the hard division on the pandemic, the hard division on, on politics, um, we have people in both parties in our church, and so that made things really messy during that election. Um, so yeah, just, just that in general, you kind of want to see the unified church of Acts, and then you show up and go, well, this is not yeah. that. This and is the divided church of Corinth, if anything. <laughs> exactly, and the challenge really becomes um, when you're as a pastor, and you're trying to present a unified vision for going forward. And one of the things that I discovered as a pastor is I can present a vision and everybody says that they have a vision of going forward, but they don't all mean the same thing. And so one of our challenges right. in leading is trying to bring these diverse groups together into a unified direction for the church. Absolutely. And very difficult to do. Um, and it takes humility. That's one thing I guess I've picked up more than anything. More than anything, I think, during all this divided time, humility is what wins the day. Just because when you start off by saying, I don't have the answers, it kind of un, uh, disarms everyone because we live in a world where everybody's so sure about everything. So to hear someone say, I don't know, but let's talk about it, really disarms people and lets them be kind of able to talk it out um, to find that common ground. I think, I think you just hit a very important point. 
a lot of times pastors go into a, a new congregation, early career pastors, and sometimes seasoned pastors go into a new church. But we do it with this uh, sense of call. God has called me here. And so whether intentional or not, we often walk in the door with a very author authoritarian tone of leadership. And I think what you said about approaching leadership with humility is something that uh, all pastors need to hear. We need to walk in the door being able to acknowledge our vulnerabilities, being able to acknowledge what we don't know. And um, leading with that humble spirit, I think you're exactly right, Andrew. I think that it, it helps the congregation, um, fold, uh, it helps them move around us and gather around us so that we can all move together. So I, I think that's true. Michael, uh, what surprised you? I know some of your story. Um, uh, Michael was, um, his church is basically was a mission plant from his home church. And his pastor gave him this assignment to, to nurture this congregation um, under, under the supervision of the home church. He had a small group of people. He's had some growth. He's had some struggles. But Michael, what surprised you? as you began to take on your first mission yes, in sir. pastoring. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I really consider um, our, our situation an anomaly um, in, in, in terms of how small we were when we started, it was, it was about 25 people and I'm not from Georgia. So I turned that church over about three times. And, uh, and I say that with humility and, and, and if my wife is li listening, she's probably laughing right now um, because we loved all of those people. It was just um, a, a situation where um, I needed to be under authority and going to seminary at the same time. And uh, so when I say anomaly, um, Buford Church of God is the, is my home church. Uh, Pastor Joey Grizzle, he 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 has mentored me and shaped me to be what God has called me to be. Um, obviously, under authority as well. Um, and so, when I say um, I think my my biggest conflict in, in through the pandemic, it's the it's the media side. It's the it's the little things that I was very familiar with, and I would struggle with that. It wasn't so much the people. Um, I feel like um, I'm one of the better uh, types to connect. Uh, I connect easily. Um, so having those conversations, whether it's one side of the fence or the other, uh, it doesn't really affect me because I know what side of the fence I'm on. And, and so um, I think that... Uh, Pastor Estes, he hit it. He hit it right on the head. It's the humility. Um, I'm, I'm in a unique, unique situation, and I promote it that way. I wish the Church of God would actually take these the bigger churches, and they would mentor the smaller churches because it gives it a great paradigm and a great structure. Um, so I want to encourage that. Um, but more importantly. Um, I'm going to go in a different direction than Pastor Estes and, um, and say, at home, um, when we were, me and my wife took the, took the church and accepted the pastorate, um, and I'm a, a seven-time war vet um, going to seminary and trying to figure out how to pastor a church, um, we and she's doing the books, children's church, the worship set, and um, so on and so forth. You know, there were times where we just had to sit down and pray. Just basic stuff. Go back to, uh, it was frustrating. It was, um, are we really cut out for this? Um, I can remember telling Pastor Joey, hey, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. You know, and him and him saying, this is what he would say. Um, if you know Pastor Joey Grizzle, he's just, he is the honest to God truth. 
in everything that he says, but he says, okay, well, if you're going to resign, um, well, we have to do this right. And so this is what I expect. And, you know, we'll, we'll bring you in front of the church. And then, and then a couple of days later, after some prayer, after consulting God and, and, and talking to him about my situation, I would be like, well, maybe this is not a good time. So uh, I, I've learned the hard way, um, you know, it's really cool that Dr. Tomerlin, you said something about war, uh, and it is a great in in boot camp. You know, you're taught to um, you're taught to strive and endure and and overcome. But ministry is different. Uh, it's the hardest thing I think I've ever done, and and I and I often sit, um, especially when when you get to talking with second and third generation pastors uh, in the church of God, you know, th there's a very good pride in, in what we do. But when I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm sitting at a table full of, of people like this, I'm I often, uh, what you don't know is I've sat at tables with, with some pretty high ranking men. And we talked about, uh, you know, hitting missions and, and, and stuff like that. But when I've sat, I've sat in rooms that have had great leadership in the church of God or on a staff, and I felt more impressed in my life uh, sitting there and learning and gaining that knowledge on how to be a, a real warrior for, for Christ. And so I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I can go all day. You know, I think it's interesting that a uh, guy who has uh, uh, been in the military and been deployed seven times finds pastoring a tougher job than being a soldier. Um, I've heard that before. I've heard that before from ex-military people. In fact, um, I've, I've pastored in Bainbridge, Georgia for several years, and there in Bainbridge, the uh, chief uh, deputy sheriff uh, for Decatur County was a Methodist pastor. And I asked him one time, what's the toughest job, being the deputy sheriff or being the Methodist pastor? And he laughed. He said, being the Methodist pastor is twice as tough as being the deputy sheriff. <laughs> so, it, you know, and it's because it's so emotionally taxing. I think that's the thing that people don't get. And that's the thing that I bring away from it. You know, I tell people, and Roger, I'm about to get to you, but I tell people, you know, between my transition, between uh, 38 years of pastoring and coming to PTS uh, to teach pastoral ministry, um, I took a sabbatical. I took a 90-day sabbatical. I didn't realize how sick and how tired I was uh, until I took that sabbatical. Uh, after 38 years of pastoring, not taking regular vacations, not never taking a sabbatical, just working all the time, um, in the midst of the sabbatical, I just emotionally collapsed. I was just exhausted. I was emotionally exhausted. And I think that's the thing that we get. Uh, we all, you know, we all shake our heads to this because we get what we're talking about. Um, this is our lives. This is our calling. This, this defines who we are. Um, and we have, it can be very frustrating. So what we have to do, and I think what you said, Michael, is, is very true. In the military and boot camp, you're taught to persevere. You're taught to, to, to you know, resilience. And I think that's one of the things we've got to learn early on in pastoring is how do we continue to take care of ourselves? How do we keep ourselves in spiritual shape? How do we develop that resilience? Because there really is some truth to every Monday morning we all want to quit. There's a little truth to that. Um, uh, you know, as we go through our lives. So I, 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 I get that and I appreciate it. All right, Roger, you've been there at Glenville and you've already pointed out, this is the church in which you were raised. You got saved in, you left Glenville to be a student pastor and did an excellent job. Go, you go back to Glenville. What surprised you about pastoring that church? Well, it surprised me the most and still to this day is how much I don't know about anything. I mean, <laughs> to be honest with you, that's the biggest thing that surprises me because, uh, you know, I spent 13 years as a student pastor and uh, I've always been a good support staff. I think you even told me that one time when I was working with you that, you know, I, I knew how to do support staff and I knew how to read a room and learn what I needed to know and kind of chameleon myself into what I needed to be to make any situation work with any guy that I work with or any place that I was. So in that, I thought I had gleaned enough that I knew how to pastor. Like when I worked with you, I knew what I'd do if I was in your shoes or any of the other guys I worked for. And uh, probably two weeks into being a pastor, I realized I didn't know anything. 
you know, uh, I think uh, Michael alluded to it, you know, it's different to, to hear and to be trained to do something. But then when you're in the middle of it, like you realize how much you don't know about everything you learned and thought you knew about doing it. And the pandemic's just fueled that for me because the world has been moved by this pandemic, the way we are, the way we think, even our faith-based beliefs have been moved by this pandemic in so many ways. And so it's like having to relearn how to pastor all over again and how to relearn how to deal with people all over again. You know, coming home, I thought I knew the people here, you know, to the point like I was their son. I'm coming home and I'm their son and walking in. I mean, I've lost more people than I've gained in the six years that I've been here. And losing people when you come home, you're losing your mom and dad, your aunt and uncle and your niece and nephew and the kids you went to school with. You know, it's not like losing strangers that you didn't have anything but a, I don't want to use the word superficial, I guess, but just like a casual growing attachment to. These are lifelong attachments that are walking out on you. And uh, just getting to that place where I realized I didn't know what I thought I did and having to learn and grow every day. That was surprising for me. Uh, but I also think getting to that place and going back to something Drew said, just being humble and realizing that's just what it is. I don't know everything and I need the Lord to help me and I need my mentors and I need pastoral friends to help guide me. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to ask the questions. It's okay to go, you know what, this worked today, but it'll never work again. And I got to relearn everything and do it in a whole new way. And I think just realizing day in and day out, take one day at a time, use each situation where it's at. Take what you know, let the Holy Spirit help you use what you know and be flexible in what you know so that you can move moment to moment, day to day and person to person in every situation. And I think staying like that and realizing you don't have to know it all. You don't have to have it all figured out. It's about the best pastoral thing that I've learned, period. Because uh, if I think I know it, something's going to come along to show me I don't. And I'm going to freak out in that moment if I'm not ready to say, all right, how can I learn and grow here? How can I be flexible here? I guess that that, that will be how I'd answer what surprises me the most. I'm, I'm reminded, and, and I find myself using a lot of military metaphors, and we'll just have to, maybe that's Michael's influence, or it might be the Apostle Paul's influence. Um, <laughs> but I'm reminded many, many years ago, this was the first Gulf War when uh, General Schwarzkopf was leading the, the war effort. Um, they were doing a press conference before the battle actually began, and somebody asked him about battle plans. And I never will forget what General Schwarzkopf said. He said, we spend a lot of time developing great battle plans. He said, but the truth is, when that first bullet is fired, everything goes out the window and you're thinking on your feet. And, you know, that's exactly the way I always felt about pastoring. We get up every morning pretty certain about what we know, pretty certain about where we want to go. But the one thing about pastoring is one accident, one hospitalization, one death in the church, uh, one crisis in the church. You have to be willing to move. You have to be willing to think on your feet. You have to be willing to, to lead intuitively um, it, 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 because churches change and, and events occur that require our attention. So um, one of the things that I, I'd like to, to go back and we'll do the, do the round again, beginning with uh, Pastor Eastes. Um, again, you've had a long history of evangelism, but now you're here serving as ex executive uh, pastor at North Sparta. Um, talk to me a little bit, talk to us a little bit about um, how you guys handle these crises, because when you have a crisis in a local congregation, you know, we've got, we're, we're living in a perpetual state of crises right now with, with the pandemic. Um, but, you know, and one of the things that I've said here is the pandemic, all of us have so many people we know who have died um, that we're not able to resolve the grief. We're always just that cycle of grief is always kind of re-upping it, is, is starting all over again. So we're living in perpetual grief and sorrow. Um, so when you have something else, other another crisis, that event, crisis event in the church, it just adds more stress. So talk to me a little bit, uh, Andrew, about how you're negotiating that stress and that crisis and leading the people as we walk through this crisis together. Certainly. 
you know, you, you said it so well that the crises just seem to build on each other and, and, and you never really get a break from it. Uh, the thing that I'm finding, and back to this humility piece, is just starting out by saying, you know, I don't have all the answers to all this either. Seems to be comforting to people in a strange way. Um, a, a lot of people right now seem just just uh, stricken by everything that's going on. Uh, you know, I, I did a sermon, uh, a couple sermons now, talking about lament and, and things of that nature and just, and just letting people know you, you can ask God questions that you don't have an answer to. Uh, the cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, has really got me going these last few months in, in preaching and thinking, uh, because it's given people permission uh, to ask those questions of God, to go to God with those uncertainties. Uh, I think the first sermon I preached in the pandemic was the, the guy that said, help my unbelief. Uh, I've been doing a lot of preaching in that vein, and, and that's also reflected in my pastoral counseling, a lot of conversations I'm having with people of, of saying, listen, I don't have all the answers to this. Uh, I had a woman come to me a while back her dad died uh, the day before Christmas of COVID and she just asked you know why would God let that happen I prayed and believed it didn't happen and all I could say in that moment was that I don't have the answers but we can go to God with these questions and that was really the most authentic way for her to work through that it's been the most authentic way for me to work through that. one of my dear mentors Dr. Ernie Varner uh, passed away of COVID and it it messed me up uh, for a good three months, probably. I just couldn't shake it of just how could God let a man like that go uh, like this? And so I had to process it myself, but also help other people process it in the middle of me trying to process it. And that's where I came down at. The cry of dereliction from the cross, the, the Psalms of lament have become a really great tool of preaching and pastoral counseling for me. I, I think that you have just unearthed a pearl of great price. Um, because up until the pandemic in our Pentecostal spirituality, there was a time a few decade, decades ago that lament and praying through was a part of our spirituality, but we lost that. Um, it was all about celebration. It was all about victory. Uh, it was all about this proclamation of victory. And I think that, um, uh, this has brought us back to, it's all right to cry. It's all right to grieve. And you said exactly what I've told several people, read the Psalms. The Psalms are always asking God, God, where are you? God, when are you going to hear my prayer? God, why have you turned your face? God, I mean, they're, they're, you know, and it's somewhere along the way, we forgot that it's okay to, to have these, these faithful and that's exactly what it is. It's a faithful conversation with God about our suffering and about our pain. Um, uh, this is not uh, COVID related, but uh, and some folks uh, will know this story, but a few years ago, one of my dear friends lost his son in an automobile accident. Uh, we lived about four and a half, five hours away. I found out early that morning. It was on a Sunday morning. So I real quick got somebody to cover my services and I drove over to his house and I stayed there all day long with him all day long. I never uttered a word. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I, there was nothing to say. What do you say to a, your, one of your friends who's just lost their son in an automobile accident? You know, you, what, what do you have to say? I poured tea. I did, you know, did everything I could just to be a good host. And I really never knew uh, what kind of an impact that I had. But he has told me since, and he's told, said it publicly since. He said, every time I turned around, I saw Dan. He said, and just Dan being there made a difference. And I think that's what we need to understand about our pastoring is um, it's better to keep our mouths shut when we don't have answers, number one. But there's something about our presence. Um, you know, I've often said um, that pastoring is a sacramental presence. When we walk into the hospital room of a dying person, we bring the presence of God with us. Um, yeah, I know that God's omnipresent. I know that God's there, but we all have seen it. They respond when we walk into the room. Um, they respond to our prayers. They respond to our presence. So I think it's really important uh, how we're present in the congregation, 
how we bring this, the presence of God to the congregation. So, uh, Drew, I think that's really important that that we allow people. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. Um, it's okay to question God. Uh, we're not losing our faith because we're crying out, help my unbelief. We're exercising our faith when we cry out, help, help my unbelief. Uh, and that we need to give people the liberty to do that, to work this out. So I think that's really good. Okay, Michael, um, I know that you, a lot of your conflict, I just want to ask you to do this. Um, in our conversations, you've already said you went through like three congregations in that first year, you know, people moving in and out. Um, I remember having conversations with you that were, um, you were very depressed, very frustrated, didn't know where to go. And then I remember having conversations with you where things had turned, uh, the church had begun to grow, new people were beginning coming, and people were sticking, and it changed your, it changed how you felt about yourself and about your ministry. So talk to me a little bit about how you nego negotiated that own tension within yourself. How did you deal with that, going from that frustration to, to being all right with what was going on? Okay, yeah, that's actually, that's actually um, such a, it really just plays in just because I think that you were absolutely spot on pointing out with uh, Pastor Estes and, and what he said, and it just reminded me, God showed me something a while back within myself. It's just, I've never really shared it with anyone, but I think this is appropriate. But if you stare at this picture behind me real quick and you guys indulge me, but I put my phone up like this, right? I start to, you start to look at it. And this is what God showed me is, is often this isn't God, but the picture is. And I've been keeping myself really close to this rather than God. And I found myself indulging in flesh, even though I'm trying to navigate ministry and and i started to recognize like i need to focus on him and draw near to him in order to lead them and so i loved how you opened up about mega church pastors man it's a it, it, in in today's age um that's the first thing that you think i'm gonna i'm gonna preach winter winter fest my first year in ministry <laughs> I know everyone here has had that thought. I did. I still have that thought. And you know what? But here's the thing is, is the, is the idea of the phone being right here and God being over here, we have conflated what we're drawing near to. And so when I started to realize that the only person I need to be preaching to in the congregation is Jesus himself, it, it all started to fall in place. Uh, we started uh, three, almost four years ago, 25 people. We run anywhere from 50 to 100 people regularly now. Um, and, and the only reason why it's 50 to 100 is because of structure, um, different, we're not big enough. I'm, I'm moving my service 30 minutes to an 11 o'clock rather than a 1030 starting in February. Um, and not because of any particular reason, uh, except for I, I think that I'm, my congregation is going to have to go to uh, two services eventually, because that's what we can, that's what, how we're going to be able to fit it, if that makes sense. I hope that, that um, you guys understand what I mean, is I could probably get to 125 people in, in the sanctuary um, uh, comfortably. Uh, and specifically with COVID, um, but going back to the anomaly that we were, you know, I can remember looking at Pastor Joey in June when at, of I think it was 2020, and being like, I think I can have church, and he's like, actually, you probably could because of the guidelines here in Georgia, and he's like, how many people you have, and I said right now it would be like 30 35 maybe 45 at, on a great day you know maybe we're having a barbecue afterwards <laughs> and um and he goes well let me run it by the the uh, bishop madden and bishop madden was like yeah i mean he fits all of the 
all of the guidelines as long as he's social distancing. And we were having church a month later. Um, and so I had to really recognize it. I just think that owning this, this label of Christianity and actually following Christ is two different things. Um, and, and, and Christianity is not a feeling, rather it's, it's a continuous movement towards him. And that's what I had to learn. I, I've, I've been saved for and following Christ for probably seven years, um, about seven years now. Um, I've been in ministry for five of those, uh, roughly at this point, maybe a little bit more. However, um, I think that what I've learned in these five years is not just, it's not just grace and favor, but always resulting back to the basics and if I can teach that to someone else even just one person I think I'm doing what Jesus would do I'm going to get emotional but um that 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 is what is how I would answer that question Dr. Tom Berman. You know the temptation for all of us who do ministry it is to get so busy doing the ministry that we forget our own spiritual disciplines and our own spiritual focus that's the temptation for all of us um, I think Michael, what, what you're just told us is that the ministry will fall into place. If we focus on our own personal spirituality, if we make sure that we're right. Um, and I think there's some truth to that. I think there's some truth to that. I think that if, if we can, because it is tough, because it's easy to get frustrated and, and it's easy to, uh, be busy and be active because spiritual disciplines take downtime. Spiritual disciplines mean we get alone. Spiritual disciplines mean we actually pray. We actually do the study beyond, beyond preparing for a sermon. We actually read scripture for our own spiritual development. And that's a whole different way of reading scripture than, than, than getting, uh, you know, preparing a sermon. Um, so I do think it, I think that's very, very important. You know, we all want to succeed. We all see ourselves as general overseer one day. We all see ourselves preaching camp meeting. I mean, that's, you know, we all have these ambitions. Um, and at some point in time, we just have to admit to ourselves, it's okay that I'm not going to be the general overseer. It's okay that I'm not going to be, you know, that I'm not going to be a mega church pastor. And I like what uh, Eugene Peterson, you know, he's going to be with the Lord now, but he did some really good pastoral theology books. And I remember uh, in one of his books reading, he said, you know, God has given every one of us a garden. And he said, too often we're trying to go, we're trying to move from one garden to another, and we never cultivate the garden we're in. And I think that's the thing that we've got to learn. Um, is to cultivate the garden we have. Um, and I've learned a little bit, you know, I've taken up a hobby in the last two or three years. I'm growing tomatoes during the spring. Uh, and, I've, and I've not done this since I was a teenager. And I'm learning patience. I'm learning gardening. I'm learning, you know, all sorts of things about how to grow good tomatoes. And I told my wife one day, I said, you know, it's amazing how much this is teaching me about pastoring, um, you know, cultivating that garden cultivating the church is the same way. Uh, you have to watch out for the weeds. Uh, you have to make sure there's good fertilizer. You have to make sure there's good nourishment. Uh, you have to stay at it and you have to take care of yourself. Um, Roger, I remember um, when you left Glen uh, by day to go to Glenville and you and I were having this conversation and I was talking to you about what you could expect. Um, and uh, um, Talk to us a little bit about that conversation, what you learned um, going into pastoring those first two years that you were there at Glenville, how, um, how you had to uh, adjust your expectations. Well, <laughs> yeah, I remember the conversation because you tried to tell me it'd be hard and I wouldn't listen, uh, <laughs> but because uh, I knew everything. By the way, before I get there, you ruined my expectation of being a state overseer, too, because I already had to know how to do that job, and I can't even have it, so I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, 
walking in the door of Glenville, when I took Glenville, uh, the church wasn't doing well. I think an overseer told me it was running about 40 people. Matter of fact, he did, He even told me they couldn't promise me a paycheck because he didn't know how the bills was going to be paid here. And in my first Sunday here, we had over 100 people, you know, because so many people came back. People, oh, if you come back, you're going to be our pastor and all this stuff. And I went from there for a straight year of watching the attendance decrease monthly from that point on, from hitting that to going down. And uh, trying to figure out what happened, like, to, in my head, here I am, I've come home, all these people said they were going to be here, this is a formula for success, I can reach out to my family, my friends, people I went to school with, everybody that I knew, and uh, and I remember you telling me, you know, it, it's going to be pastoring, even though you're going back home, it's still going to be pastoring, and this job isn't easy, and uh, it's not, and I think it was even harder, I guess, I guess what I want to say is like this, as being the pastor, it didn't matter that I was Roger come home. I was still the pastor. And there's just a view about being the pastor. You know, you put on that mantle and you're that pastor. People you were friends with, they're not your friends anymore. They see you as pastor. They can't hang out with Rog like they used to hang out with Rog before. Your family can't see Roger as Roger. They're seeing you now as a pastor. And there was a lot of relational conflicts in there that I wasn't expecting uh, I think if you go home, the job is even harder. I think you add a burden to yourself that's different than going to a community where you don't know anybody or anything uh, and going to try to do this. Uh, because as the relationships are changing for them, they're also changing for me because I'm having to learn to see them as their pastor and not just as people I always knew, just like they're having to learn to see me as their pastor and not the person they always knew. And that just adds a layer of conflict, I think, to the relationship between the parishioner and the pastor and, and trying to work that out in the congregation as well. And I think it made it even more difficult. So I think I'm answering your question there about how that first two years was, was learning that, learning how to get to that place where I was not Roger coming home, but the pastor of the Restoration Point Church of God in Glenville. And that church was having to learn that that wasn't Roger coming home, being a member of their congregation but their new pastor that was moving into church at the Restoration Point Church of God in Glenville. And I think the first two years was working the tension out of that and getting to that place for me and for them as well. Uh, I got 98% of the vote when I came to Glenville. The, the overseer told me I got 98% of the vote. The 2% I didn't get were people who didn't know who I was. You know, Not only were they the best and most enjoyable people to pastor to this day in my church, but the ones I've learned the most from and the ones that have taught me the most coming back was that two percent that the lady was straight up my family didn't vote for you we didn't know who you were and we felt like we didn't have enough of opportunity with you being the only candidate to decide but one of my best one of the best congregants I have is this family you know what I'm saying like these people would take a bullet for me to this day but they were also very kind and learning with me and we got to learn and grow together and uh I think they always recognized the relationship I had to grow into is why they were one of the chief people to stand in my corner from day one. Matter of fact, my predecessor told me, I had a conversation with my predecessor on the phone. They said, you know what? I don't know if you'll win these people because they were so close. You might not have, uh, you might not have be able to retain them or have them in your corner. And to this day, I've been one of the strongest proponents of our ministry here because again, they understood that relationship coming in, one that I wasn't willing to accept or, or work with because I, again, thought I knew it all. I think I've answered your question. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me, let's, let's do this. One of the um, ongoing things that I get in talking to um, early career pastors and in the last three years in PTS Thrive, we've had conversations with several hundred early career pastors. And one of the most frequent questions I get is negotiating uh, the family concerns, family issues. Uh, conflict with wives, um, conflict with children, how, how to negotiate that. Because as I've already pointed out, uh, pastoring requires a deep emotional investment. Um, and that sometimes places a lot of stress in our families. Um, so I'm wondering, um, has that been your experience? Uh, if it has, how, what are you doing? Or what have you done to, to, uh, to address those issues? Um, if this has not been your experience, what is it about your relationship that, that protected you from that? So again, we'll start with you, Drew. 
Yeah, uh, my situation is somewhat unique. Um, after my first year here, we made a decision to hire a full-time person to do children's ministry. And the church was really in favor of my wife being the one they hired. And and so we did that, um, which was great. My goodness, that was the right decision. And, and the only reason I had concern about it is because it was my wife. But uh, enough wise people tell you this is the route to go finally. So you know what? Yeah, that's probably the Lord. Uh, but that's unique because when we go to church, we're both working and I'm her boss. And when we come home, um, I am not her boss. I go, <laughs> it's just a different dynamic. Uh, I'm, I'm joking. But what we had to learn was boundaries. And I'm not good at that. I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm terrible at it. I'm just uh, on from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep kind of person. And so what we started doing was having one night a week where we just hit the pause button. We take our child to someone to let them keep her. And then we go and have a date night and we don't talk about the church at all. Um, or at least we try not to. It always seems to come up somehow. But but we try to have a, a, a space that's kind of for us, that the church doesn't just overshadow everything. Because it can kill you if you don't. It can just consume everything. And suddenly you don't have a relationship. You, you, you've got a children's pastor that you're married to, not a wife. And it yeah, that can happen. Um, I was grateful to have a lot of wise pastors in my life when we made that decision that told me, Drew, you got to draw those lines and have those sorts of uh, spaces carved out like the date night or, or it'll be bad. And we did, and it's worked. But if we hadn't, I could see where it would have been a disaster. Michael? Yeah, I, I concur. Um, a lot of uh, what I, I have gone through in, in that uh, aspect is it's just humility. Um, you know, I come from a, a, a know-it-all background too. I had my degree in it a couple of times, um, but I've relinquished it. I think my wife is smarter than me. I know she's smarter than me. Um, she's a better person than I am. Uh, and so a lot of times, and I say that, I say that with humility because she's been raised right. She was raised uh, in the church of God her whole life. She knows the word. Um, she knows, uh, she knows how to navigate that and she knows how to use it against me. And so we learned, we learned that obviously not everything that we have, that we are doing has to be um, about ministry. Um, I'm bivocational. Uh, I, I run a business uh, on the side that, that um, this is very new. I started a business in May, but I was doing other jobs, you know, like working for FedEx um, just to keep uh, uh, not so much paid just but just supplementing money into the church that was my my um my goal and it still is my goal um but you know just having those conversations um and hey is this a is this a ministry conversation or is this just where we can just cut up and and put the kids to the side for a minute you know or or we can lock the kids down in the basement and we can chase each other around the house up in the upstairs, right? And 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 often we for, you know, we will forget to do those things. So we become lost in our in our areas of operation. And sometimes our areas of operation is she's full time mom, uh, uh, stay staying at home, making sure the kids are where they need to be, and then I'm out running a business, and then. Uh, playing pastor on Wednesdays and, and, and Sundays. Um, and, you know, the, the humbleness about it all is uh, I had to learn to prioritize. And, you know, it's, you know, when my son starts to say, uh, we, we put it this way, our um, Jennifer, my wife, her, her grandmother just recently passed away. And, he would go over Jennifer's mother's house often and Jennifer's mother uh, took care, was personally taking care of her mother. Um, well, he recognized that for years, you know, she was bedridden. And when my son, Jamin, he, he said this, where's, where's Grammy? And, uh, you know, no one wanted to answer him except for uh, Papa. Papa said, well, she's, she's in heaven. 
and Jesus came to get her. And uh, he goes, well, is Jesus coming to get us too? It really puts things in perspective. And, you know, that really just broke us. We had to, we have to keep that at the forefront. And it's just like out of the mouth of babes, right? It's just, that just killed me inside. Like, okay, this, thank you, Lord, for showing me that I, I'm, I am pastoring my son, but I'm also showing him how to walk with Jesus. And he's four, you know, he just started preschool. And, and, and to me, it's just like, I, I think I'm learning more from him than I've learned at all. And, and that's no, no offense. Uh, but I, I just, I just find ways to learn more. And like this, this, I'm going to take home what you had just said, uh, it, and, and we're going to apply some things that we haven't been applying. So there you go. You know, I've, I've said this multitudes of times through my ministry. Uh, I made a decision decades ago that if I only won two people to Jesus throughout my entire career, as long as those two people were Aaron and Nathan Tomberl and my two sons, I was good with that. Uh, I'm confident we're there. So now I've got five grandkids. So I've got five more that I want to win. <laughs> and what I'm saying here, you said it, Michael, that we don't need to forget that we're also pastoring our families. And the best thing we can do is pastoring our families is be good husbands and good fathers. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's very important. So, all right, Roger. Well, I happen to have a good mentor that, uh, also was my MIP coordinator. He's also on the screen, uh, told a story about taking his boys to see toy story when I went through MIP and, uh, the potential you had not to do that and the choice that, that you made to do it. That story stuck with me. I never forgot that. And I mean, that was back in 2003 when I was going through MIP program. I never forgot it. Of course, I've heard you tell it about 30 times since then. Yeah. <laughs> I never forgot it. Uh, but there's something else somebody told me, and this is a little crude, but uh, somebody told me one time, said, think about who's going to be there when you're in a nursing home, wife in your backside. That's the person you need to care about the most. And I never forgot that either. And you know who that's probably going to be? My wife or my daughter. And uh, because of that, nobody matters more to me on this planet than my wife and my daughter. And as a pastor, nobody matters more to me in my church than my wife and my daughter. I mean, you know, even when I was working with you, I always took family time and, and I still do that. It is a priority in my life. Uh, I live in a church parsonage, blessed to do so. But my parishioners, unless they've been invited over for dinner, like nobody knocks on my door, pastor, I need to come in and talk to you. No. That's my wife and my daughter's sanctuary. I'm not bringing the church and critical issues and conflicts in there. Uh, I have a game room on the parsonage, and that's where I will talk to people if they want to come to the house. But I try to direct all of that to my office because my wife and daughter deserve a home. Uh, I've and this I, I may have to backtrack this one day, but I've been in credentialed paid ministry since 2003. I've never missed one of my kids. She's 14 years old. I've never missed one of her dance recitals. I've never missed one of her soccer games. I've never missed an important thing at school. I, I just don't do it. Like I make those things priorities. There's not an emergency that I can't get to later that I want my daughter to look back on and go, well, you put this before me. So far at, to 14, she'll never have to say that I put ministry before her. Uh, that's cost me some relationships. It's cost me some people but it's also kept my daughter. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the faith won't be something she looks at and goes, this was an obstacle to my relationship with my dad or me personally. Uh, and that's important too, because I want her to believe in Jesus and I want her to see Jesus as a good part of her life. Same with my wife. And I'm less good with her than I am my daughter because my wife, I think Michael said this, maybe your wife's your worship leader. My wife's my worship leader as well. And so it makes it difficult because there's a lot of demands on her she didn't ask for. Uh, I, I took this job. This is my call. So there's a lot of demands on her she didn't ask for. So I said, be very protective of her. Uh, Dan knows my wife's a huge introvert. My wife gets up on stage and sings. She's done with people. She can't do anything else. My wife don't go to the back of the church and greet and talk to people. And some people don't understand that. But I, I tell, come to my wife's defense. She gave you what she had to give you on that stage when she led worship today. Uh, I, you can set up a time to talk to her later if you really need her or text her. 
because my wife will text all day long, but she's not very person to person a communicator. Uh, but it's my job to protect that in her because I know that's who she is and I know what she's given to the church. Uh, date nights, I'm, I'm terrible at, but I also try to make the time for it. A lot of times uh, I make sure instead of doing something else I want to do, I sit with my wife and watch something with her at home or something like that. Because the demand of ministry, if it took this much time from her, I need to give her this much time on the other side. A little thing I try and do, I cook dinner every night. Uh, that shows my family I'm given to them. This is what I'm going to do. I'm coming home. I'm being here. I'm being essential at the home. All of those things I hope say to my family, the ministry was never more important to me than you are. You are my priority. And I think every pastor, male or female, needs to do that with their family because that is the number one ministry you're called to is to be that father or that mother in your home. And uh, I'm not perfect, but I try to make that the priority of my life. Okay, last thing I want us to do, and I think this has been a really good com uh, conversation, and I, I believe it, it's a helpful conversation to those who are joining us on this webinar. And I also want to point out that we're recording this, and we'll upload it to the PTS Thrive YouTube channel and make it available, so uh, we'll have some more folks watch this uh, later on. This is what I want to ask you, uh, the last thing. Uh, what, is, what, what are your primary resources? Uh, for your own um, vocational enhancement, for your own personal benefit. You know, one of the things I, Michael and I talked about was resilience, developing that resilience. How do you, how do you push through the, during those frustrating times? Uh, we've all got to have resources. Uh, the resources, it might be reading material, it might be people, but what do you see as the one or two resources in your life that keep you grounded, keep you informed, and uh, help you keep your eyes on the ball. Uh, Drew? I spend a lot of time with older pastors, particularly retired pastors, because they have more time to do that kind of a thing. Uh, and that's been the greatest benefit to me, if anything, is just, I will buy you lunch if you'll just show up and talk. And then I just sit and listen. And the amount of heartache that I have avoided in my life just because they said something that I went, oh man, if they hadn't said that, I'd have done the same stupid thing, you know, and then I avoid it. That has really helped me. And not only that, just the encouragement. Um, my goodness, older pastors have been there. They just, you leave feeling like you could conquer the world uh, from every time I, I have a conversation like that. Plus you, you learn a great deal. So that's been the greatest benefit uh, for me is retired pastors and older ministers. Michael? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, while you were asking that question, I was glad that you, you said that. Uh, I just, I look for people that tune me up, uh, just tune me up. Um, my associate pastor right now, he is 78 years old. Uh, and <laughs> and I love every aspect of that man. My, my daughter once asked me, she's like, who, who do you find the most interesting right now in your life? And I said, um, pastor Danny Smith. And, and she goes, man, he's old. He, why? Why? I said, you have no idea how much I'm stealing from him. The things that he's went through that I'm probably never going to have to go through just because I listened to him. And, uh, and, and I, I, I agree with that. And then on top of that, just the, just the background with, again, like having, having a bigger church and the support of a bigger church. You know, there's been times when the air conditioning unit went out and we don't have air conditioning, and, but, but, you know, I have someone to call and say, Hey, listen, uh, can you uh, buy us a new air conditioning unit? And we'll, we'll pay you back when, when, when we're able to, and, and it's never, ever a hesitation. It's a, it's a, just get it done. And, and we, we end up paying them back and God works it out. So that's how I'd answer that. Roger. I jotted down three things when you asked that question. The first one is good books. Uh, I, I'm all with you. Education is massive. The, a, a personal continuing education has to be a part of this job or you can't do it. For me, that's been reading everything I can put my hands on. Uh, I have read every book by everybody that I can possibly discover or find. Uh, last year, I read 80 books. I mean, not I, that's just theology books. That's not kind of fiction I read. Uh, just to resource yourself because... The one thing you can't stop doing is putting stuff in here. It ain't going to run out of room. You can pack as much stuff in there as, as you're willing to avail yourself to. 
So good books. If you're going to pastor, just good books. Just read everything you can. If you can afford it, go to school, do as much as you can there. But you can't say you can't afford to learn because you can go to thriftbooks.com and buy a book on anything for $3.95. So resource yourself, read good books. Second thing is a good mentor. Uh, the price that I would place on your head, Dr. Tomberlin, is I, I couldn't do one because uh, you are my mentor. I'm not saying that to fluff you, but I mean, if you have a mentor, somebody that's walked the path, that is willing to take the time to deal with your idiocy and answer every question and be there at your beck and call, you can't put a price on that. Anything I've ever needed to know, anything I've screwed up, anything I needed help with, a mentor has been there to lead me and guide me, to help me, to challenge me, to do whatever. And the third thing, you got to have a good friend outside of your ministry context. Somebody that's not your family and somebody that's not in your church. My best friend uh, in outside of a ministry context uh, is a Reformed Baptist guy that pastors here in my community. He and I, our children play together. We hang out and talk together. We just watch Spider-Man together. I mean, but this guy is somebody I can talk to no matter what I need, no matter what I'm going through. I mean, I, I know we didn't get into all this, but like throughout this pandemic, I've had a difficult time. Uh, and, and it's been a struggle for me to be a pastor. You said walking away every Monday. I walk away every day to NZY throughout the last two years. And that ain't no joke. Uh, and he has been a rock to keep me from either throwing in the towel or doing something really, really harmful. You know, to have that friend to just go to that I can say anything to and be myself around and not have to worry about having any repercussions for venting or dropping what I need to. So good books, good mentors, good friends. You got to have those things to do this job. I want to share my own uh, insight here. Um, I, I, you can tell Roger and I spent a lot of time together because I'd put it in the same order. Good books, good mentors, good friends. Um, I'm going to do it in a little bit different way. Um, I think that the thing that always kept me grounded as I was always developing friends, as Roger said, outside my own faith tradition, every community I ever served in, uh, my closest friends were other pastors there in that community, sometimes Baptist, Methodist, and Vidalia, the Roman Catholic uh, priest, Ben Dallas, Roger remembers Father Ben, he and I had breakfast on many occasions, um, uh, good conversation partner. Uh, we love to talk theology together. Sometimes, sometimes we'd talk football, whatever. Um, but having those uh, colleagues uh, in the community uh, to drink coffee with, and what you find out real quick is it doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal, Catholic, Methodist, or Baptist, we all have the same problems. We all have the same conflicts in our church. We all have the same family issues. I mean, we label it different, but we all have the same problems. Um, the second thing that I want to suggest, and this is going to be a little um, uh, dated, I guess, but I, I still believe in the church as a fellowship uh, and maintaining um, uh, a relationship with denominational leaders was always something that kept me grounded. I never waited for the overseer to call me. Um, I never, you know, I, I, I always went to the denominational meetings. Um, I always invited state leaders to come preach for me. I always tried to build relationships with them. Um, that denominational fellowship, that family, to this day, the Church of God is still my family. Uh, there are Church of God pastors in North Carolina and South Georgia here in Tennessee, uh, people uh, uh, in Europe that I've had the uh, uh, pleasure of uh, ministering with. Uh, that are just as much my family as my blood family, uh, the, that, that family of the Church of God um, has just really been something that has uh, kept me centered, and uh, I think that if we will take advantage of that, but now the thing is we've got to be proactive. You know, one of the things that you learn when you begin to study uh, pastors is one of the things that pastors say in all the assessments and surveys is they feel very lonely, um, you know, I never did feel lonely. I did it for 38 years, but the reason I never felt lonely is I was always proactive. I was always working to build relationships with other pastors. Um, and I think that that, that becomes a, a very important uh, source and, and stability. And the last thing I want to say as an older pastor, what I have found now, I'm 62 years old. I'm no longer pastoring. I have the pastor's heart. I hope I'm always got a pastor's heart. Um, 
but one of the things I've found now is that one of the most encouraging things to me is guys like you, the younger pastors. Uh, Roger and I talk all the time. Drew and I talk. We have good fellowship when we're around. Michael and I have talked. Chad Harris, who pastors the crossing over in Chattanooga, his father, Terry, and I have known each other for decades. Um, Chad has taken this old pastor under his wings. Um, talking to younger pastors as an older pastor, uh, hearing your stories, being involved in what you're doing, celebrating your victories um, is a source of great encouragement for me. Um, I, I feel better. I feel better after I've had a conversation. Roger will tell you, anyone who knows me knows I don't like to talk on the phone. My conversations on the phone are, you know, let's get the conversation done and goodbye. Um, but I always look forward to Roger calling. I always look forward to our conversations. Um, and I'm the same way, you know, you guys, both of you know, Drew and uh, Michael, you call me, I answer the phone, I'm willing to talk to you uh, because you add so much to my life. And so I think what we need to do as pastors um, is we need to find those people who bring strength to us. We need, of course, accountability peers. We need people in our life who can grab us by the neck and threaten to choke us if we don't get right. You know, you know, we need those people. Um, we need uh, people that can give us the wisdom when we when we're needing the wisdom when we're acting foolishly. Um, we need those that peer accountability as well. So, you know, I think for me anyway, those relationships were always the things that kept me grounded. Uh, relationships with those fellow pastors in my community, relationships with fellow pastors in the denomination, um, and now the relationship with younger pastors is just what keeps me motivated. It keeps, it's the reason I get up in the morning. So, uh, you know, those are important things. This can be a lonely job, and this will always be a difficult job, and it will always be a job filled with disappointments. Um, and I'm, I'm going to close the conversation with this. Uh, COVID has brought so many challenges to us. And honestly, I think, you know, one of the things that we've all had to do is we've had to learn how to uh, negotiate uh, services differently. We've all had to become experts with media overnight. Um, things that we didn't want to do, we've just been forced to do. We're still negotiating it. Um, and my own view is most pastors have done a really, really good job. Most churches have done a really, really good job uh, at trying to do this transition. Um, the, 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 the political culture of our country right now is, is tearing us apart, and it's tearing churches apart. Uh, one of my friends who pastors here in Tennessee said the last election split his church right down the middle. He pastors in a large area, a large city here in Tennessee. It was a multicultural church. People in, in the church on both sides felt very strongly. And he said he woke up one morning to realize half his church had gone. Um, he just, he could not manage to note, they could not manage, not only, it wasn't his failure, I don't think. I think it was that the people in the congregation just could not manage the conflict that was brought by the political culture. And so what I'm getting to is we need each other. We need to hear each other. We need to pray for each other. We need to be aware of what's going on. Uh, we need our families and we need to take care of our families. So uh, gentlemen, thank you for this converse conversation. Uh, I think that you have added, I know that you've added into my life. Uh, I know that you've added into uh, the lives of our, our listeners today. I just want to go around one more time. Uh, one last thing, just something real quick that you would just like pastors out there to hear from you. Just one thing that you would like to give them. Drew? I would just follow up on, on our conversation there about the people that are around you. One thing I started doing a while back is having uh, three different people, making sure I have three different people in my life, somebody that's ahead of me in the journey, somebody that's behind me in the journey, and somebody that's right where I'm at. And that seemed to bring a really healthy balance to me. It's been really helpful uh, because then it, the, the older person reminds you, you got a lot to learn, but the younger person reminds you, man, you do know something and you aren't completely hopeless. And the person is right there with you. You can complain to them and they get it because they're right there right now. Uh, so anyways, that just be my encouragement. Find you those three people and just hang in there together. Very good. Michael. And I just say, you know, 
everything that you do in this life is, is already been created. It's already been purposed. It's already been um, sought out. It's just up to you to trust and draw close to God and let, uh, allow him to, um, the lack of better words, um, uh, pick apart the details. Um, you're, you're already built for this. It's just whether or not you, you can tell yourself that. Um, and, and just keep growing. You draw close. Uh, that's my cry. That's that, that's my heart is, is is anything that I've ever done as a Christian, as a follower of Christ is just, if I can't be close to him, then I, then I'm, then I'm drawing away from him. And that's my, my encouraging word. Roger. You know, the biggest thing I think I've learned, and I just learned this really over the last year, pastoring in the totality of who I am. And, and and that was one of the most freeing things I ever learned as a pastor. You know, I stopped groceries for seven years. Never once did I think I was only a stock person. I was an electrician at airport for five years. I never thought the totality of who I am as an electrician. But I spent all this time pastoring thinking, this is who I am. I'm nothing outside of this. And so anytime I failed, anytime I made a mistake, things are going good, things are going bad, all of that in pastoring totaled who I was, how I felt. Just in the last year, I've realized I am called to pastor. Pastoring is what I do for a living, but pastoring is not who I am. And that has made me a much better pastor because it's allowed me to realize God called me to be Roger. In being Roger, pastoring is one of the things God called me to do, but it's not the totality of who God made me to be. And I think that's probably the best thing I could hand down to any pastor, because if you can get past where you get here, pastoring is just what I do. It's not who I am. It makes you so much better at your job and so much better at everything else that you do in this life. Uh, before we go, I can't do this without one more opportunity, uh, Roger. Uh, it's time for you to register and uh, begin your graduate program here at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. Uh, <laughs> you are um you are there you are there you're 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 a brilliant a brilliant man and uh so i look forward to that time to be able to hug your neck when you've got that uh gown on for graduation uh again all of you that have joined us for this webinar thank you so much if you have uh, questions about what, how pts thrive can serve you just send me an email uh or you can message me on facebook on the pts thrive facebook page uh, the other thing I would suggest there, you may be thinking about a graduate studies at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. Give me a call. We'd be glad to talk to you about that. Um, Drew, Michael, Roger, thank you very much for the conversation. Look forward to uh, seeing you again. And uh, if there's anything I can do for you, God bless you all, man. Just give me a call. I'm happy to do it. Thank you, guys.